Greetings, and today on LGR, we've got a neat little system I picked up while thrifting a couple years back. I think two, three years, five. Oh, well, okay. So I found this back in 2017, apparently, for a grand total of $2 at a local Goodwill. I didn't get footage of that, but it was in one of those outlet center clearance bins where you buy things by the pound, and since this doesn't weigh much, it didn't cost much. At first glance, it looked like an external optical drive or a cable modem or something, but nope! This is a straight-up Intel-based computer system running Windows, known as the Green PC. It had a $599 starting price for the base model in 2011, as assembled and sold by Sassy's Computers Incorporated in Asheville, North Carolina. Yeah! Here in LGR, I don't get the chance to go hyper-local very often when it comes to computers, but today that chance has arrived. Sassy's Computers was a local computer retailer and repair shop based in Asheville, the same city I was thrifting in when I found this machine, so that makes sense. It turns out Sassy's started off back in 1995, offering what they claimed to be the fastest Mac and PC repair services in town. Initially doing business out of this charming building, before moving to this larger space in 1999 and then to their final main location on Merriman Avenue in 2007. It's where they also built and sold their own computer systems, like the Green PC in 2011. A machine that apparently gained them some recognition in the local news, with stories going on about how energy efficient and green it was. Which, yeah, if you know anything about Asheville, is precisely the kind of thing that makes the local news. A mountain retailer is making an effort to become more environmentally friendly by selling green computers. Sassy's Computers offers a PC that consumes less power than a single compact fluorescent light. It's energy efficient, totally silent, and no larger than a hardcover book. Sassy's even gave the green PC its own TV commercial, which <laughs> is just peak 2010's North Carolina right here. So why is it called the green PC? Sassy's green PC consumes 10 times less energy than a standard sized desktop. That's amazing. Come check out Sassy's Computer's green PC, the perfect solution for business or home. It's small, but powerful. Kudos to you, Affliction Man. You've sold me on the green PC. Unfortunately, Sassy's didn't sell everyone else, I guess, as they closed up shop in 2018. Shutting down their main Asheville storefronts and moving to a small home office for a while, which no longer seems to be in business either. So it goes, man. Times are rough for local computer repair outfits, especially in the Carolinas if my own experiences count for much. Like, do you remember the Volta V I covered on LGR a while back? Yeah, the company behind them, CDO Technology, shut down as well, after 22 years in Greenville, South Carolina. It sucks. But while these companies may be gone here on LGR, their creations will not be forgotten. Which brings us back to the green PC, and yeah, you've probably deduced that Sassy's wasn't responsible for the actual design of the system. As with many small systems builders, they made use of off-the-shelf machines and configured them to meet customers' needs. With the green PC in particular being a Shuttle XS35GT, with this one being the V2 model from 2012. Depending on where you look, it's been called a slim PC, a mini PC, an HT PC, a net top, a thin client, some of those less accurate than others, but regardless of nomenclature, it's a tidy little package of components built for relative silence and low power consumption. On the front, beneath the power buttons, you've got an SD card reader, USB 2.0 port, and a slimline DVD RW drive. And around back, there's audio in and out, Ethernet, four USB 2.0 ports, VGA and HDMI out, and a connector for a 19 volt power supply. And that's it, at least externally. And going internal is easy stuff, with only a single screw around back, holding on two side panels. Each of which slides off to reveal the tightly packed innards. Really, you can think about this as a desktop form factor netbook, considering it's dual-core Intel Atom D525. A processor from 2010 running at 1.8 GHz used in multiple netbooks, like the ASUS EEE PC1215N being one example. 
It also uses an NVIDIA Ion graphics chip hidden away beside the CPU somewhere underneath these heat sinks with no exhaust fans, it's all passively cooled. What is visible are the PCBs for the 802.11n Wi-Fi, front USB and SD card slot, along with the CMOS battery and the RAM, which in this instance is half an 8GB SODIMM kit, providing the maximum supported 4 gigs of DDR3-1333 RAM. And then there's the 2.5-inch Scorpio hard disk, a 500 gigabyte 5400 RPM SATA drive from Western Digital, which was still chock full of files when I got it from Goodwill, packing what I presume to be its original installation of Windows 7. It makes sense for early 2012, I suppose, but man, having had a couple of similarly specced Intel Atom netbooks back then, it would not be my OS of choice for this hardware. It's a better choice than Vista, but I find Windows 7 to be a bit much for the CPU and graphics at hand, even when running at its best. And this is certainly not running at its best, with a legitimately impressive quantity of bloatware, adware, toolbars, and even legit scams loading on startup. Seriously, it took over five minutes to arrive at a functional Windows environment, and I use the term functional loosely here, as the sheer amount of nonsense running means that system resources are pushed to the limits with even the most basic of tasks. Apparently I installed DOSBox on here to run Doom last time I had it powered on, and yeah, even that struggles. And what's with this guy's head on screen? <laughs> Doom guy's on screen head is already enough. Now, this guy here is thoroughly unwelcome and seems to be slowing down and stuttering the emulator too. So yeah, first step is swapping out the old hard drive and starting over with a fresh installation on an SSD. Now, I've got this cheap 120 gig model from PNY, which sure is a lot less space, but I really don't need that much for what I have planned, and the speed bump will be significant. I also figured I'd try upgrading the RAM since I had a faster 4 gig SODIMM module, but that didn't quite work out. Turns out it's not fully compatible with the board, and it refuses to boot when installed, so eh, whatever. I swapped the old one back in, no big deal. Really, the more important thing was moving on from spinning rust to solid state, and going with a leaner operating system. And for that, I'm going with Windows XP, specifically SP3 Media Center Edition, cause why not? This has a kind of mini home theater PC vibe anyway with its DVD drive and HDMI output. Plus XP is what I ended up installing on my Intel Atom netbooks back in the day, so I already know it works a bit smoother than Vista or 7. It could be argued that Linux would be even better suited to the task, and yeah, no disagreements there, but that's not what I'm in the mood for today, and I've been meaning to put together a smaller, simpler, quieter XP build for a while anyway. Much as I enjoy the LGR XP Dream PC, it's a friggin' monster that sounds like a Harrier jet, and its office warming space heater qualities are real, so an XP Green PC is just the ticket. And yeah, with that finished up, I quickly installed the drivers for things like sound, graphics card readers, and networking. Thankfully, at the time of recording, the shuttle website still had all of it, so it was smooth sailing. All that was left was to restore the original Sassy's wallpapers, because come on, we gotta respect the classics! And there we go. Our $2 green PC is upgraded and refreshed with seriously faster storage and a Windows install that's free of unthinkable downloaded horrors. So, let me get some era-appropriate benchmarks and games installed, and we'll finally check out what all this Shuttle XS35 GT could actually do over one decade ago. Alrighty, so our green PC has Windows XP running nicely off the SSD, feeling ten times faster and smoother than the adware-riddled abomination of a configuration that we had before on the old hard drive. Perfect for playing some late 90s favorites like 3D Pinball Space Cadet. And let's be honest, do you really need anything more than that? Well, okay, maybe Doom. Martian demon hunting is always a welcome experience in my house. And if you recall how badly it ran under DOSBox before, well, seeing it play as it should is quite refreshing. No more weird scammy tech support head floating up top either, just good old wholesome monster slaughter. Nice. 
Duke Nukem 3D, of course, works well too, as you'd expect. Though it does start to chug if you run it at higher resolutions, but yeah, the chipsets being used provide more than enough horsepower for emulating most any system from the mid-90s and before. It was one of the most appealing things to me about buying an Intel Atom-based netbook in the late 2000s, really. However, when it comes to playing Windows PC games, your options slim down quite a bit. Despite this machine being constructed in 2012 and its Ion graphics chip supporting DirectX 10 and OpenGL 3.3, there's basically zero chance you'll have a good time playing any substantial PC games from the previous six or seven years from when it was made. The green PC is ideal for games from 1999 to 2003 or so, seeing as its hardware was cut down and optimized for low energy consumption, with media and home productivity applications rather than any sort of up-to-date gaming. And of course, the Media Center software that was installed with this version of Windows works just fine. It's good for playing media up to 1080p and DVD movies and stuff like that. <laughs> but yeah, getting into 3D acceleration, uh, it's a little bit mixed. So as an example, running 3D Mark 06 on a decent 2012 desktop gaming PC, you could expect benchmark results between 10 and 12,000 or so. But with this, you've effectively got a low-power netbook on your desk. And even with 4 gigs of RAM and an SSD, the final score maxes out at just over 1400 at a resolution of 1024 by 768 Conversely, running older 3D Mark tests from 2003 fares much better, resulting in a total score of 3922. As a point of comparison, I also ran that same benchmark on the Dell Inspiron 9100 I covered on LGR a while back, which had a score of 3391, and that was a laptop from 2004. So yeah, this little thing is simply more at home with titles from a decade prior to when it was manufactured. That's why I'm using a 4x3 monitor, by the way, since most things I can actually run well on here are designed for that aspect ratio. Which, you know, is fine by me. There is no shortage of awesome stuff to play from the early 2000s, from Age of Empires 2, Age of Kings, to Need for Speed, Porsche Unleashed. You can crank those kind of games to the max and have absolutely no problem playing all day long. By the way, I've got fraps going as well for the rest of these, so you can see the uncapped frame rate in the top left. Again, all good stuff on late 90s, early 2000s titles. But results are varied once you get into the mid-2000s, like with Grand Theft Auto San Andreas from 2004. Even running at 800 by 600 resolution, performance wavers with most graphical effects turned to high. Obviously, simpler indoor scenes are going to be smooth and fast, but it's often around the upper 20s to low 30s while wandering around outside and dropping down even lower when things inevitably get hairy. Now, this is with medium draw distance as well. Performance absolutely tanks going much higher. I can't complain too much, it's still better than Definitive Edition, so, you know. People Can Fly's Painkiller from 2004 fares better, though, with frame rates in the mid-40s to upper 50s for the most part, and then dropping down a bit once you've got hordes of baddies getting blasted on screen, which is most of the game. It can even dip down into the 20s when certain visuals occur, like exploding debris and that blurring effect when you're hit, but eh, I had even worse performance when I played this back when it was new. This ain't too shabby. However, it's worse with Source Engine games, like Half-Life 2 here, also from 04. Most of the time it's in the mid to upper 30s when you're just wandering around, but it's not long before things get really pretty bad. Larger outdoor areas of City 17 are rough. And even taking the resolution and graphical quality settings down a notch doesn't do much to help matters. Playable, sure, but for a system from 2012, I could see being disappointed if you weren't prepared for just how limited it actually is in terms of hardware. Doom 3 is another go-to test, of course, being one of the biggest graphical powerhouses of the mid-2000s and a constant benchmark since its launch in 2004. And really, it's not that bad in 800 by 600 And this is on high settings, too. Things certainly get pretty choppy, again being hurt by certain screen effects when you're injured in particular, but for the most part I'd say it's playable with an average frame rate in the mid-30s. Again though, this is kind of pushing what the system can handle, and you'd be foolish to expect good results on things from the latter half of the 2000s. Speaking of which, I know y'all have already probably asked this in the comments, can it run Crisis? Yep, sure can. 
technically at the lowest settings, yeah, it tries its best. Again, it really depends on where you are in the game and how many physical interactions and graphical effects are happening at once. That poor Intel Atom is getting one heck of a workout, I can tell you that much. The system is radiating some heat, too, while remaining steadily silent since there aren't any cooling fans or spinning discs. Silent, but rather slow, with the majority of Crisis never venturing outside the mid-twenties in terms of frame rate and frequently crapping itself into the teens. Eh, success? Whatever, it does run Crisis, and that's kinda neat. Really, that sums up the shuttle XS35 GT, aka Sassy's Green PC, in general. It's just kinda neat. Its size and form factor make it super appealing for whatever reason. And it got even cooler too. Sassy's also sold this bundle with a 20 inch LCD for $870. It made use of Shuttle's Visa mounting kit that lets you stick the thing on the back of your monitor, making for a jerry-rigged all-in-one design. I haven't gotten one of those yet, but I did find one for sale through Office Depot, oddly enough, so we'll see if that shows up in the future. For now, though, I think this is still pretty fun stuff, despite its hardware being woefully slow for when it was built. That's truly not a problem, though, as long as you limit what you're doing to what it can handle. And it's best at handling software from the early days of Windows XP, which, if you're going to be stuck somewhere, is not a bad place to be stuck in my opinion. If nothing else, I just enjoy looking back at old solutions like this and many PCs in general, seeing what kind of performance can be squeezed out of them. And hopefully you enjoyed looking back with me. And hey, if you've messed around with any of these older mini PCs or even actually owned a Sassy's green PC or equivalent, definitely share your experiences in the comments. I'm curious how you might have used it. And as always, thanks for watching LGR.